Hey guys, Adam here, and today we're going to dive into some of the settings in SimuCube's TrueDrive software. Um, if you are a VRS Direct Drive wheelbase user, some of these will apply to you. I'm going to kind of go over them in a somewhat high level, somewhat deep level. Um, it's it's going to kind of vary from kind of one step to the next. If you're a Fanatec user, I apologize. I've never even seen their Direct Drive software, and I I'm not going to be of much help to you in this video, but let's go ahead and jump right in. Now, I am going to hope that if you're watching this video, number one, you've watched the first part of this video where we talk about all of the sliders and settings that are available within iRacing itself. And that number two, you have at least played around in the True Drive software. You know how to use online profiles that people have shared, and maybe you've even tried to create a profile of your own so if you're at that point awesome if I need to do a true drive 101 where I talk about online profiles uh, leave a comment down below it only take me a couple of minutes to get that up but I want to keep this video short as possible so we're just gonna be right in it here we're in the edit force feedback window as we're trying to create a new profile for our SimuCube 2. So let's talk about these sliders, at least the important ones, what they do and uh, what effects changing them have on your feedback. So the first setting, overall strength. You paid for a 20, 25, or 30 newton meter wheel if you're using the ultimate, set that to 100%. Remember in the first video, I talk about how the more room that iRacing has to work with in the force feedback range, the more detail you're going to be able to get out of the simulator. So make sure that's cranked all the way to 100%. You want to give iRacing as much headroom as possible. For our steering range, I run 900 degrees for everything. I have talked to some AC and ACC drivers that run 1080. I don't know why they do that, um, but they do. I recommend 900 for everything and just leave it. For your bump stop range, 900 as well. Make sure your bump stop range, if this is 1080 up here, make sure your range is 1080 down here. For the bump stop feels, uh, soft is the default setting and that's what I run. All this does is this changes the amount of stopping force when you hit the end of that rotation range. So if you've gone to the full 900 degrees and that wheel stops on soft, you get just a little bit of play uh, versus on hard where it's just like an instant, you know, you ain't going no further. All right, so now we're going to move down here to our constantly operating filters. Uh, these are the most important, and these are the ones where I'm going to spend the most time uh, in this video on. So the first thing that I recommend you do is have iRacing or whatever your sim of choice is loaded up and a car that you're very familiar with and a track that you're very familiar with because that's going to reduce the amount of time it takes to go through all of these settings and this is no easy task so i will say this if you have found a profile that somebody posted online that you absolutely think is amazing stop watching this video you don't need to go any further but if you want to understand what all of these do stick with me and i'm going to help you create a profile that works best for you so the first thing that I like to do when I'm in here is I like to adjust the force reconstruction filter. Now in iRacing, because it's only at 60 Hertz, the telemetry for force feedback, it can be a little blocky if you were to graph that out. Even if you have the use linear mode checked, it can still not be super smooth. What this force reconstruction filter does is it tries to even more smooth out that force feedback signal coming from iRacing. Now, with every single one of the sliders down here that we are going to adjust, um, the more processing we put on that force feedback signal, whether it's from iRacing to the wheel or the wheel back to iRacing, that more latency we are going to add. So we want to try to run everything as low as possible to reduce the amount of latency to keep us as directly connected to the car in our sim of choice so that our inputs are almost immediately felt on the car as they would be in the real world. 
So for the force reconstruction filter, I recommend running some laps at one and then some laps at nine. So you can see both ends of the spectrum and see kind of what that does. And if the force feedback feels like super glass smooth, which we know it shouldn't if we've driven cars in the real world, um, turn that back down. If you get all the way down to off or one and you find that it's a little, little notchy in the force feedback, go ahead and bump that up one setting. If you're still feeling it, maybe go one more. But pay attention because if it's feeling clunky, or if it's feeling spiky, there's two different things. So a spike is you're going over and you hit a bump and it's a real sudden, just hard jerk. That's not notchy. Notchy is you're going through Talladega in a Indy car and the force feedback is like, it's there and it's not, and it's there and it's not. That's notchy. So that's where you want to use more reconstruction filter. You want to add kind of this in. I think uh, I generally run this at two on almost every one of my profiles. That seems to be kind of the best point for me. Torque bandwidth filter, make sure this is set to unlimited. All the torque bandwidth filter does is if you have any of these set, so if I were to set this at a thousand, anything in the telemetry that's coming over a higher frequency above a thousand hertz, it's going to get clipped from the telemetry. We don't want to do that. We don't want to trim anything coming from the sim as far as force feedback goes because we want to be able to tell what our car is doing at all times. So just go ahead and set this to unlimited. A thousand hertz is the default setting, so I recommend changing that as well. So now, as we're talking about spikes in your force feedback a moment ago, that's down here where the peaking and notch filter comes in. Now it's difficult to determine exactly where the, the the spikes are happening in your force feedback sometimes like at what frequency so you kind of have to play with this for a while this took a really long time for me to get set right and i'll talk briefly about what each one of these do because they all work in tandem to kind of help cut down those spikes so the, cent the center frequency is that frequency around where those spikes occur. And like I said, that's kind of something that's really difficult to determine without the proper electronic laboratory equipment to test that out and see. So you do have to play with this quite a bit. Um, the attenuation is how much cut is being applied to the spikes at those frequencies. So if your spike occurs at 100 hertz and you want to cut that back by 25 dB, that's where your attenuation is. But maybe the spike's not that bad. Maybe you only want to cut it back by like 10 dB. You can go ahead and adjust that here. Now the Q factor is the quality factor of that cut and it determines essentially how narrow the bandwidth is around your center frequency where the attenuation gets applied. So the higher the Q value that you have, it's going to affect a narrower band around the center frequency. The lower your Q value, the bigger that band around the center frequency is going to be. So if you really want to get super detailed, you can target that one specific area where you're getting spikes and just clean that completely right up. And so that's where um, you can kind of fine tune those spikes in the force feedback. So the next thing I like to do is I like to come and I want to adjust the damping filter. And the damping filter exists to sort of prevent user error, I guess is the best way to put it, user input error. And the best example of a user input error I can give, you're exiting a corner, you're getting a bit of oversteer, the back end starting to slide out, and you go to correct, but you sort of overcorrect a little bit, the damping will help reduce that overcorrection because it adds a little bit of additional resistance to the wheel. Now you need to be very careful here with damping. Um, you want to make sure that the the overcorrection and then sliding back the other way isn't something that's occurring because of the setup. So make sure you're using a car you know with a setup you know at a track you know 
and if you're finding that that's happening where you're overcorrecting in the cars and then spinning out the other direction from the initial slide go ahead and add a little bit of damping i tend to run this around 10 percent or lower if possible in almost all cars and i do find that it does help me a little bit now friction and inertia i'm going to talk about these they're they do almost the same thing but they do it at opposite ends so friction adds dead weight inertia adds um it's dead weight as well almost so think of it this way so friction is the sort of force you need to overcome to start the wheel inertia is also the same thing but inertia more so applies to stopping the wheel so if i were to have inertia all the way off or at one percent and i go like this essentially if there was zero inertia on this force feedback direct drive motor this thing would spin forever there's nothing acting against that force to slow it down if i were to right now with nothing on my wheelbase and just crank this inertia all the way up to 100 i would not be able to turn this wheel at all because there is so much force acting against the wheel in fact without anything connected to it this wheel would oscillate pretty bad and shake my entire rig um, so we don't want to do that so if you find that the initial start of a turn is like super easy and it's really lightweight add a little bit of friction if you find that like stopping that input point to then start to come back the other way becomes a little difficult because you end up going too far add just a little bit of inertia on there as well um, that'll kind of help smooth your inputs out just a little bit but remember don't go too far uh, because we're adding more processing and thus more latency your slew rate limit this is a very technical deep dive thing that i don't think i want to spend the time to get into on this video run slew rate as low as possible in fact i think 0.32 i think 0.32 yes this is where i kind of run this um this just essentially controls the electrical impulse signals you want to kind of keep this down as low as possible of course ultra low latency mode it's it's a little interesting because the more we crank up ultra low latency low mode the more processing we add to that signal and what this is kind of doing is it's trying to take your input and not amplify it but sort of predict where that next input's going to be i tend to run this almost off i think i've got it at like one percent or two percent right now in the profile that i generally use um i don't run this too much because i don't want to add additional processing to the the, the signal down here direct input effect fine tuning so now this more so is fine tuning your inputs to the wheel so if you've already got damping and friction set up here you can fine tune those just a little bit more down here at the bottom find what works for you like if you're up here playing around and like 10 percent damping feels a little too much but eight or nine feels maybe a little too low you can fine tune that on your the input side which means what you're telling the wheel to do with your hands uh right here for the rest of these spring sine wave square sawtooth triangle and without an oscilloscope i can't properly show you what all of those are doing just leave those at the default 100 percent settings and you'll be good to go so once you've created your profile after a lot of testing because this does take time it took me I, I don't even want to think about how many hours it took me to finally find my perfect profile we're just going to go ahead and click ok we'll click save and it'll take a minute for true drive and then it's already checked as the active profile so now we can go ahead we can run some laps if it feels good great if we want to tweak it a little bit more we can come back here and we can click edit 
and then edit the force feedback again this menu will pop back up and you can go through and you can play with all of these sliders now I do want to show you one last thing real quick because I mentioned in the first video that I when I first started sim racing with my simu cube 2 pro I copied Dan Suzuki's settings and here they are down here I'll show you what Dan is running we can see that Dan is running you know 15% damping 23% inertia slew rate limit is all the way off and 16% for ultra low latency mode I mean he's got the sliders are, are moved a little bit to the right lately I've been really liking uh, Daniel Morad's setup which has even less damping friction inertia and ultra low latency mode shut all the way off this setup right here is really really done well for me it might not be the best for you but i just want to show you like and testing both of these two profiles side by side with just those minor differences in the two slider settings it is a huge difference in the way the car feels on the track so take some time, drive some laps, play with all of these sliders. If you have any more questions, feel free, comment uh, down below. If you found that this video was of some use to you at all and you actually maybe got something out of it like I'm hoping you did, please give the video a quick thumbs up uh, so we can help more people find this educational sim racing content that I'm trying to create um, because I just want everybody to get faster because when everybody's fast, it's so much more fun. And until next time, Stay safe out there, everybody, and we will see you out on the track.